Welcome to Jews in the South, a series of programs featuring field trips and lectures with Georgia State University's Jewish Studies program. In this edition, we hear from Assistant Professor of History, Marnie Davis, and visiting lecturer in Hebrew, Marion Broida, on the importance of studying Jewish history in the South, as students tour and exhibit on the history of the venerable Riches Department Store at the William Bremen Jewish Heritage Museum. Tim Fralingos, Director of Events and Exhibitions, begins by describing a Riches tradition, Fashionata. Fashionata was an event held every September uh, for Riches. It was a fashion show, it was a concert, it was part theater. Uh, by the end, they would hold it three nights in a row, sell out the Fox Theater. It was very, very popular. It was a fundraiser. They would give all the funds to charity, usually to arts groups. Uh, it was a way for them to show off their fall collection. Um, designers from New York would come down, very famous, Bill Blass and people like that. Um, it was all run by this man here. This is Saul Kent. Um, he was born Saul Kaminsky in Columbus, Georgia. He went to University of Chicago uh, and majored in theater. He went back to Columbus and started window dressing at a department store in Columbus. He was found by a Rich's uh, execu executive, brought back to Atlanta, and the rest is kind of fashion history in this city. He became the fashion go-to guy for all the uh, hoity-toity women of Atlanta. They would go to him. They wouldn't buy anything unless he recommended them. He would tell them, you know, uh, if they look good, if they look bad, what was it? We, I've talked to women who said, you know, they own a purse that they, that they could not live without uh, because Saul Kent uh, recommended it to him. But he was also the main um, artistic uh, artist behind um, uh, Fashionata. He didn't start Fashionata. The first one was in 1946, but he definitely revived it in the 1950s and it became his thing. He uh, would... Um, uh, he always had his models, uh, and I've spoken to many of these models, and he knew how to talk to a model to make a model feel like they were the most important models, uh, most important or the best model it is. They all thought they were his favorite. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, just, just, he was tremendously gifted in that way. He would, uh, before Fashionata, before they go out on stage, he would tell them, be divine, uh, as they walked out there. Um, I spoke to his wife. His wife is still living. He passed away in 2001. His wife is still living. And she kept talking about mannequins. And it took me a while. And I figured it out that that's what the model, they would call the models mannequins. So um, I don't know if that's still done in the industry or if that was just a, a, something that was Saul Kent thing, but that was very interesting to me. Uh, this is from 1963. This was the uh, Fashionata crew from 1963. So um, they were told, obviously, don't smile. Whatever you do, don't uh, smile. Notice the cigarette um, there, but many of them are still around. Uh, one of the models did uh, tell a great story, though. She um, uh, she, she's not in this, this photo, unfortunately. She said it was a great job for a young mother. She was a young mother. She got hired as a model. She could drop her kids off at school, go get her hair done. They would do fashion shows in the Magnolia Room. They would do the fashion show, and they'd be done by the time of carpool, so they could go back and pick up the kids. So she said it was great. They didn't get paid a lot, but she had four boys, and she got a discount on clothes shopping, so you know it worked out for her in the end. But it was interesting to think of modeling uh, in that way. The downtown Riches store had a tea room. They called it the Magnolia Room. It was re-kind of um, decorated in the 1940s. They had always had a restaurant, but they redecorated in the 1940s to kind of fit this antebellum uh, look, probably pop definitely popularized by Gone with the Wind, and they named it the Magnolia Room. And it was a place that women could come and have a very fancy lunch. They put on gloves, they wear hats, uh, daughters and, and mothers would come. A tea room is kind of a unique place in the South. A tea room, uh, you know, there's Mary Max 
that still exists, but a tea room meant in the 40s and the 50s that women could go there and not have to be there with a husband or a man. Uh, whereas restaurants, you couldn't have, uh, women couldn't have dined alone. A tea room, it was perfectly acceptable. So that's kind of the, the idea of the tea room. Uh, and they would come, they'd eat lunch, there would be a fashion show. Uh, on Saturdays throughout the year, they'd have what were called spend the day teas, and they would bus women in from all over the state, or they'd ride a train. There was a train called the Nancy Hanks that would come from Columbus, uh, and they would come into the train station, they'd be greeted by someone from Riches, they'd all be given a, a, a ribbon, a white ribbon, so they'd walk through the store, so what a target, you know, all the salespeople knew they're here to buy, so they'd walk through the store, buy, and then they'd have lunch, see the fashion show, and it's called a spend the day tea. We're having them today, we're having, we have them with our exhibit, people come see the exhibit and then have tea, so it's a uh, brilliant idea. But that was a Magnolia Room, very popular. But like every restaurant in Atlanta, in downtown Atlanta, it was segregated up until 1962. Now we think 1962. Um, and uh, African Americans, while they could shop at Riches, they couldn't try on clothes. The return policy wasn't the same uh, for African Americans in Riches. Uh, and they definitely were not allowed to eat in the Magnolia Room. This was a segregated space. And so in 1960, uh, right after the sit-ins started in Greensboro, the students, in Atlanta and the Atlanta University Center, Spelman, Morehouse, Clark, decided that things needed to change in downtown Atlanta. Uh, and they wrote uh, what uh, became uh, what, what is called an appeal for human rights that got published in the Atlanta Journal and the Atlanta Constitution. And it's basically a statement of what the students were looking for. They were looking for basic human rights, the ability to eat where they chose, the ability to, to, um, to, uh, uh, to, to, to go to the movies, to buy houses, where they, the, the right to fair job hiring practice, all those things. So they publish this and they start sit-ins, but they don't start at any private establishments. They don't start the Magnolia Room. They go to public buildings. They go to state, uh, the courthouses and cafeterias, things like that, because they're hoping to get a case. And uh, at the time, they don't think a private establishment that they're going to get the court to decide in their favor. But they do start in the summer. And this is very interesting because what's happening is the students are leading in this movement, the adults, many of the African-American adults don't want anything to do with it. And uh, Atlanta was relatively peaceful. There were places you knew you didn't go and places you could go, and that was okay for many of the adults. So the students in the summer decide they need to change that, and they start asking people to stop shopping at Riches and other stores, boycott the stores, turn in your credit cards, uh, support us as we're trying to help you shop with dignity. And they actually gain a lot of support. In, 19, in the fall of 1960, they decide the time has come to focus on private establishments, and they decide Riches is the place because riches is the biggest. If riches changes, the rest of the city will change as well. And so about 40 students head off from the Atlanta University Center. They head to the Magnolia Room on October 19th, but they're joined by someone who's not a student. They're joined by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He had not participated in anything up to that point in Atlanta out of deference to his father, uh, Daddy, uh, Daddy King, but he decided this was important enough to be part of it. Some people think that he did it really to protect the students. He was a little nervous about what might happen to the students. And he thought if he were there, he could calm them down. Everyone gets arrested. They're in prison overnight. This is Dr. King's first night in prison. He had been arrested before, but never spent a night in prison. It gets national news, national attention. He had been on probation for a traffic violation. And so the students get released. Riches drops the charges. The students get released. Dr. King is held over, sent to a state prison uh, to wait for bail. And this is October 1960 during the uh, campaign for presidency of both Nixon and Kennedy and so people in the student movement start appealing to the campaigns to make statements about this force the issue Nixon remains silent Kennedy is forced to say something he calls up Coretta Scott King offers support that gets national attention Daddy King who's a Southern Baptist says I know he's Catholic but he reached out to my daughter or he reached out to my daughter-in-law and my son so I'm gonna vote for him now makes it okay for these Baptists to vote for a Catholic. 
First time uh, in the history of the United States, African Americans vote Democrat rather than Republican. Kennedy wins a very close election. Maybe it's all because of, of what happens here uh, at Riches, but it's an interesting story. The student movement story, though, doesn't end there. Nothing changes after that sit-in. Boycotts continue, protests continue. It's not until Easter time comes when the boycotts are really starting to affect the bottom line that the downtown re the retailers decide to sit down with the protesters. Um, and they reluctantly agree that when the schools integrate in the fall of 1961, the lunch counters will as well. Um, it doesn't actually happen. I just found out things, I just found this out yesterday. It actually takes all the way till 1962 that the first African Americans actually eat at the Magnolia Room. We had a great program a few, uh, just about a week ago um, about this whole era. And um, somebody asked the panelists, well, did you ever go to the Magnolia Room afterwards? And one of them said, yes, we did or whatever. But one of them said, but that wasn't the point. We didn't want to eat. We weren't doing these protests because we wanted to eat. We could eat, and you know, we could eat at other places. It was the ability, and it was the chance, you know, and the choice to be able to eat that we were fighting for. So we had this integrating riches program, and we brought some of the leaders, mostly the women. I really wanted to focus on the women that were part of the movement because the Magnolia Room was a women's space, things like that. And one of the women said, uh, one of the women who was actually engaged with um, uh, some of the negotiations said that they had thought that because Dick Rich was Jewish that there might be some sympathy you know, in that. So it's an interesting uh, kind of thing to think about. Uh, and of course the Jewish community, as you've probably learned, was very split on the issues of civil rights. It was not, it was not all, you know, for and against. You know, you had, uh, you had many who were on the picket lines with the students, many Jewish uh, people, and then you had Lebs, you know, in downtown Atlanta, which was, which was, was, is not, was not quite Lester Maddox's place, but, you know, uh, there was uh, quite a bit of, um, uh, the closest that Atlanta got to real violence was probably at Lebs. So, you know, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting story. It's one that we hope to explore more and more here at the Bremen. That split highlights how issues of race affected the Jewish experience, says assistant professor of history, Marnie Davis. Uh, the issue of race is another one where uh, Jews who lived in the huge metropolises of the Northeast and the Midwest, again, because they lived in these large communities where issues of um, the, the black-white divide were not as, uh, as, didn't have as much you know, importance to one's daily existence. Jews weren't necessarily trying to position themselves in terms of race. In the South, when Jews came to the South, uh, they recognized fairly quickly that to to be seen as not white was a was a was potentially dangerous, uh, and, and they recognized what happened to African Americans and and uh, the, the the oppression and the marginalization that they experienced, and so. Jews in the South were had to sort of negotiate their own their own self presentation, because what mattered to them too was not just to be uh, accepted by the mainstream, but an important part of Jewish identity is to think of oneself as different, as a people apart, but to then present yourself as too far apart puts you in a in a potentially vulnerable position. So this this interesting uh, sort of balancing act that Jews have to had to um, had to uh, engage in of being, you know, different but the same. And to watch them sort of present themselves as white but as a different kind of white but not too different uh, is a pretty interesting thing to see. So what other traditions uh, that riches have that continue to this day. The pink pig, very popular uh, here in Atlanta. The pink pig uh, was started uh, as the Snowball Express uh, back in um, the 1950s. It was a monorail that rode on the, uh, on the ceiling of the toy department. Kids could come in, ride it, see all the toys, and then tell their, kid, tell their parents what they want. Uh, eventually, uh, they started the Secret Santa Shop, so the kids would get off the train, and then 
and they go through this secret Santa shop and they could actually buy gifts for their parents that would already be wrapped. So they could just point out, you know, I, I imagine they had things like gloves and, you know, the same things we give to our parents today, ties and things like that kids give to their parents today. Um, but it was, you know, an ingenious way of getting kids to want to come shopping. But for riches, it wasn't good enough, the Snowball Express. They needed it to be branded. They needed it to be, this is, you could only do this at riches. So in 1959, they were inspired by a cartoon and they decided to make it look like a pig. And so that's why that was the beginning of the pink pig. Um, there were two pink pigs. Eventually they moved it from the toy department onto the roof of the building. And that's where it rode around the great tree. Most people remember riding it around the great tree on the roof of the building. There were two pigs. This is Percival and there was a female pig. Does anyone know what the female pig was called? Priscilla. Uh, and you know it's Priscilla because she has eyelashes. So, um, but grown, you know, men and women would, would scrunch into there with their kids as they'd ride around uh, to see it. And so this, of course, is a tradition that continues today. But, you know, making shopping fun. Along with the pink pig at the holidays was another tradition for Atlanta, the great tree. And this was really um, something that brought the community together. It was a moment every year that Atlantans got together to watch the great tree be lit. Whether you watched it in, in there in person or you watch it on TV, it was a point, it was, it was a tradition in people's lives. It was always the night of Thanksgiving um, at night. People would come downtown and they put it on the roof of this crystal bridge that linked the store for homes that you see on the left and the store for fashions. It's a huge, gigantic tree. You can kind of see a little bit about how usually they would get a, get a tree this tall and light it. They would bring in community choirs to sing on the crystal bridge and they would sing, you know, the, the bottom would start and then the next floor would light up, the next floor and next floor. And finally they'd finish with the chorus of Oh Holy Night and at the highest, um, a highest note of Oh Holy Night, I'm not going to give it to you, they would light the tree up and you can come light the tree if you'd like yourself. A little bit about the size, you can see this is an ornament, a bear ornament that was on the tree and these are two uh, ornaments uh, that were on the tree so it was significant, significant um, size. But again it was making, making this store part of your life uh, was always something Riches was trying um, to do. So we'll continue around here. The one time, so Riches made the cover of Time Magazine with the light. It was a, an article about Christmas shopping, but they used an illustration of the great tree. We end the exhibit with a chance for people to share their own memories. And in 1967, a book was written by uh, Celestine Sibley um, called Dear Store. It was a collection of memories about uh, riches. And uh, it was very, very popular. And so we've decided to ask people to share their own memories with us about the store. You can see uh, these are about three uh, cards deep now as people continue to share with us. Uh, we're, it, we love it. We get some very specific stories of how it connected to people's lives. So it kind of proves our point about how much riches was connected to people's lives. And then behind me, we end the exhibit with what are called institutional ads. These were full. These are um, proofs of full page ads that were printed in the Atlanta Constitution. These are from the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, um, uh, and they were part of our collection. But you'll notice they don't advertise a product. They don't advertise a sale. What they're advertising instead is riches, the idea of riches, and they're advertising and, you know, to keep shopping downtown, to keep coming downtown. Uh, and so Rich's, you know, uh, even as late as the 80s, was, was, uh, was trying to get people to continue to come and, and be downtown. It was a big part of their effort. Uh, and, and some other things, like this one over here encourages people to, you know, for community service and things like that. So they really took this role, this corporate role um, uh, in, uh, in the city. Uh, they took it very seriously. Um, uh, and. and uh, throughout their history. Jews in the city. The tour of the Riches exhibit was only one part of the students' engagement with the museum, as visiting lecturer Marion Broida explains. We have had guest lectures by both the current archivist, Jeremy Katz, and the prior archivist, Sandra Berman, uh, who talked about the Leo Frank case. And we also had a tour of their exhibit on Riches department store. Uh, which was wonderfully fun. And we also have an open invitation to use the archives. So all of the students will be researching an individual uh, who was prominent in the Jewish community sometime in the last couple of hundred years in Atlanta. And they'll, many of them will be going to use the archives at the Bremen to get 
letters, diaries, listen to transcripts of oral histories. I mean, all kinds of really, really exciting primary source information. During the tour of the exhibit, questions about the Rich family connection to the Jewish faith. Did Morris or Dick Rich ever connect their religious uh, values to their, to their corporate philosophy? Not in public. Not that we have a record of um, uh, necessarily. Dick Rich was fairly private uh, person. I mean, as, as out in the public as he was, I think he kept a lot of the personal things very personal. Um, you know, they, they did not, uh, Dick, you know, never didn't convert or anything like that. He remained a supporter of the temple and things like that throughout his, his life. Um, but, you know, I, d I don't know, you know, the, the idea of the Jewish department store, um, you know, it's a story that can be told in every city, um, but it's particularly in the South, I think it's a great story um, because in many ways, so in the North, you had department stores owned by non-Jews and Jews and everyone was competing against each other. But in the South, there was uh, the, the um, in most of the small towns, it was always a Jewish family that ran, ran the department store uh, because of the connections, because of the history. Uh, and because of the department store was the, um, because the department store was the place where uh, a lot of luxuries or um, uh, culture was getting into some of these small towns, you know? So in some ways that, so, the, so this Jewish family that owned this department store, it was the only conduit of that kind of thing because there weren't the art museums. Even in Atlanta, even in Atlanta, riches would have these import and export shows. It was the only place to see this kind of stuff because the high wasn't there yet or all these museums weren't there yet. And so the department store served that cultural function as well in the South, um, which is very significant to think about that all being part of kind of the Jewish um, influence in the South. The influence of riches offers rich data on similarities and differences in the Jewish experience for scholars. And it has affected how Jews have become American because they became Southern Americans. And that transforms their Jewish practices. It transforms their communities. Uh, the fact that they were living in the South where race was so important and their numbers and the number of Jews were so few, that mattered too. And it affected how they presented themselves to the, the, the general population. Uh, it affected the kinds of jobs that they took. Uh, it affected the ways that they organized their congregations and the ways that they talked about race too, with the way they presented themselves as a component of the white population. Uh, and all of that seems to me something that you would never, never understand uh, or really begin to get to appreciate if you were only studying the Jews of New York, which, while of course incredibly important, uh, was, a, was itself sort of a regionally specific experience. And though those numbers are enormous. Uh, it doesn't speak to the wide variety, the varieties of Jewish experience, the way that if you come south and you see how southern Jewish life is different, uh, it gives you a sense of, of uh, how Jewishness is, a, is, is um, a variant, fluid, maybe even an unstable thing. Uh, and I really, I enjoyed that a lot. And I think that that's important to show students that there's not just a monolithic Jewish experience, that no matter where you go, everything is the same. In fact, if you go to uh, Atlanta uh, or uh, Clarksdale, Mississippi, you will find a very different Jewish experience than you'll find in New York or Brooklyn, and that matters a lot. For that reason, the Jewish Studies program at Georgia State University focuses on that textured Southern experience. Marion Broida. Well, Atlanta is actually the center of a tremendous range of important Jewish figures in the South and nationally, and two really key events that happened in Southern Jewish history took place here in Atlanta. One of them was the trial of Leo Frank, uh, and the other was the Temple bombing. The Leo Frank case, yet another example of the influence of race. Leo Frank was regarded as, uh, in, I, I mean, the question of his racial identity is a really complicated one. I, I, he, he wasn't regarded as uh, a, a black person, but that he was uh, insufficiently um, committed to white supremacy, I guess that you could say, um, and that that was a that was a, a um, 
uh, an accusation that had been made against Jews in the United States um, in the South uh, for decades. And uh, Frank, Frank really uh, bore the runt of that. Uh, but that uh, Jews were painfully aware that they were sort of walking a very fine line because uh, they didn't want to just blend into the mainstream of white Americans, white Southerners, uh, but they wanted to make sure that they were accepted. As part of the Jewish Studies program, students also focus on contemporary Jewish life in the South. There has been sort of regional, blurring of regional boundaries uh, throughout the country. So it's definitely true as it's become easier to uh, migrate from the north to the south or to the west coast and then back to the south and it's you know it's not like it takes six weeks to get somewhere and you'll never see your family again uh, that that definitely changes things and and yet I think that there is still an effort on the part of southern Jews to maintain a even if it's not um, uh, if, if it's not sort of enforced by social codes the way that it was a hundred years ago, there's still a sense of pride of, and especially a sense of pride of, of being part of a, a, a true minority that has kind of stuck it out and maintained uh, you know, a sense of, of cohesion uh, and uh, group communal identity, uh, even despite the uh, the, the, the pressures uh, to, to blend in. A visit to Oakland Cemetery's Jewish section is one example of how students are exposed to a range of topics within Jewish studies. The Jewish studies program is very interdisciplinary um, because the faculty come from all kinds of different departments. So I'm from the Middle East Institute, but we also have historians like Marnie Davis, and we have people from the literature department, from the communication department, um, teaching, for example, a course on Israeli television or Israeli culture um, and literature, um, religious studies, of course. So there's courses available in biblical studies. I taught a course on Psalms. Um, yeah, so it's very, very interdisciplinary. The Jewish Studies program at Georgia State University began in 2002, and its focus on Jews in the South is of particular interest to assistant professor Marnie Davis. The reason that I've become so fascinated with Southern Jewish history is that it's given me a way of understanding how fluid the Jewish experience is, how different it is uh, in different places. I mean, when I uh, told, I, I decided from New York, I was living in New York, and I decided that I was going to come to Atlanta to study Southern Jewish history and to understand the American Jewish experience. And I talked to my undergraduate advisor, and he's a, he was a Jew from Brooklyn, and he thought that I had made a foolish error because how many Jews could possibly be living in the South? And he said to me, Your, the, the, the number of Jews on my block was probably larger than the number of Jews in the towns and the cities that you're going to be studying, uh, by which he meant uh, it couldn't matter. It doesn't matter what happened in the South to Jews because the numbers are so small. But moving here, I came here and I, I went to Emory and I studied Southern Jewish history, and I came to realize that regional difference really matters. Difference is studied on site in the community. Right now we're in the process of trying to expand our partnerships with the Jewish community and um, one of the things that the Jewish studies minors have to do is they need to intern with a Jewish agency. So that's another example of the kind of partnerships that we're doing. Partnerships that highlight the rich diversity of Jews in the South.